Okay. Hello everyone. Hello. Okay. Hi, I yeah. think. Okay, so I think now we can start the event. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the uh, Step Special Steam Seminar, which is month the seventh edition of this seminar series. And uh, okay, so Chris, will you start the event, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Sungwoo. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, it, Mr. Park, did you have any greetings that you were going to pass on to, to open the session this evening? Or oh uh, yes, yes, 소장님 이거 인사 말 진행하시면 될것 같습니다. 지금 어 알았어요. 안녕하세요, 포디스리 과학 창의 연구소 박호걸 소장입니다. 오늘 진행되는 스페셜 스팀 세미나에 참여하신 여러분 모두에게 감사 말씀을 드립니다. 이 스페셜 스팀 세미나는 작년 12월 여러분께 첫 선을 보인 이래 어느덧 일곱 번째 행사가 되었습니다. 오늘은 총세 분의 연사를 모시고 진행하게 되었습니다. 이제 오늘의 사회자 중한 분이자 익스프레스 워크숍의 스팀 디렉터이신 크리스토프 페니베시 박사님을 소개해 드립니다. So, okay. Hello everyone. I'm Hogal Park, director of the 4D Mathematical Science and Creativity Research Institute. I would like to thank everybody participating today's special STEAM seminar. This event series started last December, and today's event is already the seventh edition of this seminar series. Today, we have two sessions with a total of three special guests. Now, uh, now let me do, so uh, let me introduce today's moderators, Dr. Christoph Benibeji, STEAM director of the Experience Workshop, and also our uh, another our another another moderator, Dr. Christopher Brownell from uh, Fresno's uh, from. Uh, I'm sorry. Fresno Pacific University. I'm sorry. Yeah, Fresno Pacific University. Yes. Please give. Please give a warm. I'll give you the mic to Chris. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Sungwoo. <laughs> I I appreciate your uh, that working through all of that. That's a lot to remember and read off. Um, tonight we have um, two different two different talks coming to us, and uh, we'll be um, enjoying some some very in, engaging speakers uh, and very excited and happy to share with us um, material, I'm sure. We, right now, um, the first first pair, uh, Leonard Sumner, Summer and Patrick Newell are from Ideas to Foster Creativity. They're gonna speak on Ideas to Foster Creativity in the 21st century um, and uh, creative professionals that inspire change. So, uh, Leonard and Patrick, um, please uh, take it away. I don't know who's going to be speaking first, um, but we'll leave it to you. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. you thank you, Chris. Right. Before I would give the floor oh. uh, to our uh, dear guests, uh, I would like to say a few words uh, about them because uh, you might be curious that uh, whom uh, we will meet uh, uh, today or tonight, depending on the time zone uh, where you are. Actually, these wonderful speakers are not even in the same time zone. So they will share a talk uh, from two different spots uh, of the globe. So uh, actually, uh, Leonard Sommer uh, is, in, is in Germany and uh, his uh, creative uh, agency uh, uh, director uh, in, in Germany, but also he has uh, a deep interest uh, in, in education as well, and especially creative education. And a uh, few years ago, maybe many years ago, he decided uh, to collect all the best creative practices all around the world. And uh, he created a wonderful book. It's called Classroom Think Tank. And this is an excellent co co collection of uh, more than 100 practices uh, selected all around the globe. And this book, is just going to be published soon, actually, probably with your, with your help and with your contribution, because uh, this book is now in uh, crowdsourcing uh, uh, phase. So I'm sure that uh, Leonard will uh, introduce uh, where the book it is. And uh, his uh, friend, Patrick Newell, is in Tokyo. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Tokyo International School and also the professor of the uh, Shizenkan University in Tokyo, Japan. 
and uh, he's uh, sitting in the top of a skyscraper actually right now. So I will really ask him to show his view uh, in the beginning of, of the talk. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. It's in Shibuya district uh, in, in Tokyo, if I'm right. And uh, I'm really excited uh, to hear uh, about how to foster creativity in the 21st century education. And I'm really uh, looking forward to this, to this journey, what this book uh, will offer to us. And I'm sure we will get a sneak peek uh, in, in this presentation. So Leonard and Patrick, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Christoph. Patrick, I can see you. Are you there? Yes, um, he's here. Good, wonderful. Yes. So, wonderful. So again, um, just introducing myself, because I'm going to ask you, Patrick, uh, just to uh, share some words. So my name is Leonard Summer, as mentioned. I'm not a teacher, as Christoph said. I'm not a professor and, or education expert. I'm an entrepreneur in the creative and digital transformation industries for more than 25 years. This is why I was always dependent on creative problem solving skills. Um, since 2015, I'm a member also of the board of Education Y. It's a mass scaling platform for German schools to put children in charge of their own learning and to enable each of them to develop essential social and emotional skills. Education Y has applied this peer based approach to parenting and to the wider educational ecosystem of teacher education already. And in uh, 2013, I met Patrick the first time in Tokyo. Um, and a warm welcome to you, Patrick. Please share some impressions of Tokyo and also some impressions and let us know who you are and what you have done so far. So here's my view. I think I, some of you might have already seen that. I'm mm -hmm. on the 40, 45th floor of a, in Shibuya of a building called Scramble. This is one of the Olympic stadiums from 1964. And this is the going to be the opening ceremony in track and field stadium uh, starting on July 23rd. This is just a, a view of Tokyo. I'm in a co-working space called WeWork. Uh, I'm an advisor for WeWork Japan. I started my own international school uh, 25 years ago and I've been very involved with the future of learning and technology and, and basically STEAM education now for a long time, well before they call it STEAM education. And I could go on and on and on about all the fun things I've done in my life, but I'll stop there. Let, um, let me just first, could you share why actually you decided to create that school? What was, uh, what was happening in your family? Well, I was interested. I had two children and we're trying to think about what kind of school to put them in. And just was looking around. And then I started thinking about why do we learn? What do we remember from school? What's important? And I realized that schools were had quite a gap between what's important for our future and, and what we remembered from school. And so I decided to start my own school called Tokyo International School 25 years ago for my own children. And it just went from you know five students to 12 and grew and grew and grew and became actually a model school for Japan and actually many schools around the world around very, very aligned with STEAM education. Great. Um... What have you personally seen change over the past 20 years in education and learning? What have been your observations? Unfortunately, almost nothing. Um, I've been so frustrated. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a recovering educator, um, not an, a recovering alcoholic. I'm a recovering educator because it's been so ridiculous how little has changed. And it's great to see initiatives like STEAM because it's, it's actually bringing together different subject areas in an interdisciplinary way to teach some of the skills that we need for the future. But in regards to education and change, unfortunately, very little and really hoping that we'll have a lot more moving forward. And this whole COVID situation, I think, has very much disrupted the possibility of what learning could look like in a hybrid model situation. And how is STEAM impacting change on education and future of learning? That's a, that's a great question. So they, and I guess one way to put it is if you think about uh, in life, we don't stop and say, oh, I'm doing math or I'm doing science or I'm doing arts too much, right? We may be drawing a painting or painting a painting or something and then we realize we're doing arts. 
but it's it's been to me quite ridiculous in many ways that we've had subjects isolated in the way that we have because our brain works in an interdisciplinary way and the world works in an interdisciplinary way. So I think what's wonderful about STEAM is it's tying together many very important subjects in an interdisciplinary way so that we can look at things in a holistic way to make and create our future utilizing all the different things. And if you think about the future and, and how to wire the brain for change, we wire our brain for change by creating and making things. So if you think about, you know, if when you make and create something, it didn't exist before. So you're imagining into the future something that you envision, and then you're taking all of the different resources or things that you know, and let's just say STEAM, for example, all the different areas of STEAM, and you're integrating that together to make and create something that doesn't exist. And I think that's really powerful. And if you think about the way technology is shifting the world and, and, and the impact it's having, STEAM is really, I think, very aligned with the kind of change that we, that we need. Um, just jump back to the two-year school again, because uh, I saw it um, already in, well, I think there was 2013. Uh, what, what is so different? What have you done different in that school? So why is it, is it a change for, at least for your, for, your, for your family? I mean, you did it for your kids. So what, what is different there? I think the key is just, um, and again, it's really, to me, very aligned with STEAM because it's interdisciplinary. It nurtures the skills we need for the future, which is critical thinking and creativity, design thinking mentality. So really, instead of focusing on subject area, it was very much project-based learning. We did not have textbooks. We did not, never had any textbooks. And so it was always about creating something, making something, solving the world's problem, understanding a concept in a project way and then integrating together all the different subject areas. And, and then also the way the students shared what they had learned was using digital tools. They might've made videos or a presentation. So they used a lot of digital tools to share um, what they had learned versus just taking a, a typical exam. And, and this is all the way back in 1995, we were doing this. So again, it, you know, for me, I've been a frustrated recovering educator because unfortunately most education systems in the world haven't really moved into this more interdisciplinary um, way. And mainly the reason they haven't moved is because the governments haven't figured out a way to assess the masses um, beyond standardized testing that will allow for them to see how their populations are doing in the millions of students that they have. And that's, I think the biggest challenge really, as well as the way that universities are assessing how we enter them. So I think that's two reasons why we haven't seen that convergence um, earlier. Um, you are also teaching still today um, a class at a Japanese high school. How is it going? What, what are you doing there? Well, what's been, you know, Japan is really known for its science and its engineering and its math and its technology, uh, but there isn't a lot of integrating happening. And so what we've actually done is we've, we've gone more of an inquiry-based designed thinking approach. And so um, what's been interesting, one is we've been integrating the different subject areas, but at the same time, we've been enabling the students to take control of their learning. And so right now, well, I'll just back up a little bit. So we had these students create their own uh, classroom guidelines. Uh, they had $1,000 to design their classroom. And um, they took a social and emotional intelligence test to kind of see how they were social and emotionally in the class. And this isn't STEAM, but I think at a high school age, social and emotional intelligence is really important. And then from that base now, we're looking at Olympics and we're looking at technology and we're looking at how, um, because obviously we're hosting the Olympics in a, in a month's time, and how is technology impacting the Olympics? The athletes and what they wear or the Paralympics and the, and the different um, limbs they have or, or different things they use to assist them might be the wheelchairs that they're using as well as the technology and used in the media so the students right now are taking a real you know subject which is the olympics and looking at how the integration of steam plays a role in the olympics and how that might be different in 10 years from now as technology and engineering uh, and science evolves interesting um 
And on the other side, you're a professor also at the Shisekan University. Um, how, are you also teaching, or are you including STEAM as well there in your teaching, or? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm teaching a class on the future, uh, future cities, future of work, and future skills. And again, I think it's really quite silly to, I mean, there's times when we need to go deep into a sin, single subject area, don't get me wrong, but really it's, it's really about integration. So if you think about the future of cities, um, when you're creating a city, say 2035, you're integrating a lot of different things. You might be thinking about sustainability or um, how, you know, how, you know, things related to sustainability, sustainability. Then you're thinking about technology and then you're thinking about the concept of movement. I was just working with Honda and Honda is creating their, their kind of one of their key things is mobility, right? So what, is a, what does mobility mean in the future? Is, uh, what kind of vehicles, how do we move around? How do we use technology to be mobile kind of thing? So what's wonderful is that with the older students, you don't really, it kind of everything is interdisciplinary. And I think that's the key thing with STEAM is it's future, that, that subject areas we think that are related to technology, and the future together with the arts. And it's, it's quite powerful. So to answer your question, we're integrating it all the time. It's just not called STEAM. Last question. And I just want to say one thing. We have a lot of people from different places. It's so wonderful to see Apakaba for those that are coming from Indonesia and California. That's my uh, home state as well. And we England and Finland and the Netherlands. This is, this is uh, extraordinary actually to see the different people that are here. Um, so thank you all for joining us from around the world. Yes, Leonard, sorry, you had one more question? No worries, I'm just, uh, you're always so passionate and excited and there's uh, always happy when you share these emotions with everybody. So um, actually, last two minutes, you wrote actually the outro for my book and that's, um, it's more or less about where should, edu uh, let's say, future education go to? And maybe you can share some of these thoughts, what you think what's important in the future. Before we then, I would like also to invite one or two people from the audience, just um, if they want to have some questions to Patrick before I come to the book. But what's, what's, what's actually the challenge of the future of education? I, I think it's uh, the adults. Actually, um, well, I mean, it, so it, in regards to the future of education, it's how do we find the, the, the synergy between letting somebody develop at their own pace individually and bringing them together as humans collectively to, to share and make and create a better world. And so if you think about in our lives, the only time in our lives where we say, okay, you're 11 years old, so you must be together with 20 something or whatever the number is, other 11 year olds, and you're expected to advance pretty much at the same pace together. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And so the wonderful thing moving forward is there's a lot of uh, um, programs online that are allowing for students to go at their individual pace and what they're comfortable with. And, and look at things over and over again and so on and so on in an interactive way because our, our digital natives really need to be much more interactive than we did when we were growing up. So I think the technology and allowing for us to be individual learners and to develop what the ministries of education or boards of education think that we should learn. I, mean, I think one thing that's not gonna change is the education boards and ministries around the world are always gonna, I think, tell us what they think we should learn. A lot of times they don't tell us how to learn. And so what's wonderful is now we have technology that I think will allow for a lot more people and AI that's coming and the ability to adapt programs to each learner. So I think this hybrid model of how much can we do online and how much can we make school feel like after school, right? So how much can we create situations where students are able to come together and really be human and, and really develop, as you were saying earlier, the social and emotional intelligences that we really need moving forward. So it's the human side that we need to develop as groups. I think a lot of what school is about is teaching people how to get along and how to be together. And Japan is extraordinary at that. I think it's one of the most extraordinary countries in the world. I've been here for about 30 years and people being together as one and moving together as one. And it's very difficult to move together as one, as we all know, if we've led teams and groups. Um, so the future of learning really is a hybrid 
of being human, making and creating things. I call it creative collective intelligence and allowing technology to um, enable us to, to learn at our own pace and, and motivate us to go further, but at the same time, meeting the standards and guidelines that our governments are asking us to meet. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so before I would love to share my, let's say the traveling about my book is, uh, is there anybody who wants to ask a question to Patrick eventually to anybody who wants to join just, uh, anybody from the audience question? Christoph, you want to ask a question? Christopher? Oh, Steve, Steven's raising his hand. Steven, yeah. please. Cool. All right, can I interrupt now? Yeah, sure. Welcome. Well, well you know, like I said, I'm, it's two in the morning, and I thought I was going to have trouble staying awake until Patrick started talking. Well, I, Travi, I, I want to debate you on things for about six hours already, and I've only known you for about two minutes. It's, I mean, Beautiful. it's like, <laughs> you're, I can tell you're a troublemaker. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Positive exactly. disruption. Positive disruption. Oh yeah. And so not right now, but I just want to let you know that, that, uh, Oh God, I can't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start. So I just want to <laughs> let you know that now I won't, now I won't be able to go to sleep. <laughs> so it's, it, yeah, you just set off so many, not, yeah, they're good alarms. I mean, a good, so many of the things you stated, I'm like you have been involved for over half a century and we've been through the cycles of this and the cycles of that. And, and you hit some very key points. Um, I live in a part of the world where we have teachers out in Western Kansas that are, have been steam teachers in their entire career starting in the 1920s because they're one room schoolhouse, you know, everything was integrated. And what we've learned from those teachers excellent teachers and so i just i don't want to d debate any particular issues but if i run into you again we're going to be talking a long time <laughs> sounds great Stephen. <laughs> looking forward to it all right T tree I, I don't know why i keep looking at tree or try um are you are you from indonesia is that correct i i love your country it's such an amazing country i don't know if you wanted to ask anything or share anything here we go scaffold training teachers changing from subject-based curriculum to steam equipped um Hosam is kind of a, about how to help that. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's finding good role models that shares that. So in this high school, I I'm an advisor for the high school. It's all boys school, 700 students um, and Japanese education system is pretty rigid. And when I walk around this high school, I see, I'm not kidding you, one third of the students are sleeping. Another third are on their computers doing something. And then maybe a quarter of them are chatting and then the rest are listening to the teacher trying to yell above them to, to share uh, what they want to share with the students. But the, one, the interesting part is all of the different criteria is being met. They're in the classroom. The teacher is teaching the curriculum they're supposed to teach and they will be assessed on what they're learning at some stage, right? So they're ticking all the boxes there. But I think one of the most important things, so I'm actually teaching the class because I need, I need to role model the change we wish to see. So I think when you talk about um, training teachers from changing from subject-based curriculum to STEAM curriculum, is you really need to show them good examples, show them classrooms where students are working in groups, they're really engaged, they're really interacting, they're, they're taking the different subject areas and they're integrating them in a way that's meaningful and has purpose, would be my answer to that. To your question, Hosam, if I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you, Patrick. I think we could even, I mean, we did that already to talk about hours. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's jump to our, um, to our project. We have been also involved a lot and also Christoph had been involved. So thanks for this. So um, to share now, build the bridge to classroom think tank. And for this, I would be happy to share my screen. So excuse me if I get personal at the beginning. Um, my kids, Marlon and Miller, actually, they are today 14 and 16. Uh, they are growing up in what is without question the most rapid period of change in human history. They differ from former generations in many aspects. Um, they've grown up with digital tech and taking it for granted, having learned how to see it from infancy. 
and they've only ever known a world that changes hour to hour, second to second in innovation. In 2014, uh, when I graduated with an executive MBA, um, my master thesis at the Berlin School of Creative Leadership focused on one question. I asked myself how to foster creativity in 21st century education. And from this center question, the book and private passion project was born. Uh, using my background in creative consulting and innovation, I started the project, Classroom Think Tank. It was, at the beginning, it was a research initiative, um, also created for the, for the master thesis, to encourage and enable dialogue and resources to be shared between creatives, professionals, and education. Classroom Think Tank was, for me, a great trip around the world. Um, that's also the reason why I just mentioned that we, we already spoke about hours um, in Tokyo, so I met Patrick there. My curiosity brought me to so many people who had been open to share their time, secrets, and also their ideas. And since then, I've asked more than 100 creatives and education futurists in 35 countries, so teachers, principals, and school leaders, to rethink 21st century education. A lot of them actually had been also creative professionals um, who actually need these skills in their daily work. Let me, before I uh, give you an outlook into the book, just give the chance to the kids, to a kid to share their voice. How can an education system designed for the industrial age still be relevant in the 21st century? Let's take a look at some numbers. 65% of today's children will grow up to work in jobs that don't yet exist. 60% of managers see creativity as tomorrow's most important skill. But 85% believe that creativity is suppressed in schools. Come to inspire a vision of schools that foster creativity with room for children's minds to develop outside of the box thinking. The teachers who guide creativity instead of conformity with lessons that prepare them for the unexpected as well as the expected. I want to know what could the education system learn from the creative industry? So you saw that I'm more or less mainly the, the, the curator. So a lot of people just helped. And um, you saw also uh, four names that are so essential. Um, for example, the designer Bruno Bertani loved that project so much that his team, they created the whole book for free. It's 300 pages in an amazing design. There's a professor, Tamara Dolman from Canada, who just helped me through to go the book, also with really checking if everything's educationally OK, because I'm, I'm a creative, not a teacher. <laughs> And then Patrick finally, and Sarah uh, McGill, who then proofread it, because actually it's not my, my main mother language, uh, tongue language. So let's start now with uh, just an outlook to the book. A book about 21st century education needs to a special cover, actually, we thought. And that's why the designer decided to announce the creative cover project. So in the launch period until August 15th, even everybody of you. So I want to just onboard you now to create a cover in the next weeks and to share it with me. So it's gonna be part of the book because actually the book itself will have no cover. It will have all covers that are submitted. So if you hand in a cover, it's gonna be part of this cover as well. And in the end, all covers actually, the designs will become part of this book via augmented reality. Plus additionally, I put it together a jury from creative professionals from, I think it's from 12 countries as well who judge then um, the best covers. And these the six covers they like the most, they, they are actually also published in the book inside. And there's one winner actually will be then finally printed to be the cover of the book jacket. So um, I have already, and that, that was so cool, I think in the last weeks, um, already three schools and one university reached out and their classes are now working on these covers. So I'm gonna be excited actually what's, what that's gonna be ending. And certainly also want, uh, I, I think it's going to be hard to, to maybe craft a book out of, of wood, but maybe also from the Netherlands, I would be happy to have a cover as well. <laughs> so please share. Um, 
let's jump in actually. Classroom Think Tank will bring together a compact analysis and the experts' opinions of the challenge um, that's actually that we are facing. So it's, it's interesting now, so I'm just more or less covering also where we're coming from, where we went through and where we are still actually. Then the book brings together relevant research insights and inspiring statements from well-known experts and also um, experts that I reached out to. On more than 300 pages, actually, um, I will share um, these even, that, that, that's interesting, I suppose, I jumped over it. That's actually what you see here is like an analysis also what the creative leadership actually, how that changed and also how the leadership skills need to evolve and how actually people influence that, but the school didn't even change anything. So and uh, with an exciting and creative design, actually, numerous creators from all over the globe share their ideas, actually, about change, about actually why, actually, and how professors could actually bring in another perspective. Also, how a nurturing envi environment should be created or could be created. what actually the organizational design would be actually as kind of an influencer. And also that's an interesting part, what actually how the culture, and it's maybe one of the most biggest challenges, how the culture needs uh, to be changed. And Patrick, you mentioned the parents. I see myself always, that's, I mean, the, the problem is very often that we are still grown up in a culture and that we still bring these values to our kids, the educational wise, and I think that's, that's, that's a lot of change we need to face, especially. Then what if actually teachers become creative leaders and how actually could they do this? And this is actually the part of you, Patrick. Maybe you can share one or two sentences about that. You wrote an article about how to create a nurturing learning environment at home. Maybe Patrick, jump in, just share one, two phrases about that. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to frame it first. Uh, on average, children only spend about 20 percent of the whole year in school. 20 percent. If you do the math, the number of days by the number of hours and divide it by eight thousand seven hundred and sixty, you will see it's probably about 16 to 20 percent of the time that the children are in school. So the parents are the primary educators. So then if most people, most parents don't think about how their home could be a learning environment. How do you create different centers and spaces within your home that allows for children to holistically develop and grow and to nurture their confidence and make them feel safe? That's the key thing. And most parents haven't looked at their home. They think, okay, this is the desk where they study. So therefore, and this is the game room or this is the video room or whatever, but really think about home as a learning space. Every part of it has an opportunity to be a learning opportunity for our children. We just don't look at it that way. Thanks. Um, I thought when, when I read it, it was just, oh, maybe I also outsource too much, actually, because I think that's more or less a little bit the thought. And we, we are outsourcing education. <laughs> and then we just think, yeah, at once. And then we go to work. So it's thanks for that. Um, certainly also the book brings on stage a lot of methods um, that actually could change education. So 16 interesting and inspiring methods are just brought out, not in detail, but just to inspire and, and also with the, connected to the resources where, it's, um, where they are collected. Then explained by the creators and creative minds who are successfully using these methods actually uh, for their teams if they, um, use to create a creative excellence. Um, these methods will be rolled out. Then certainly you spoke about that um, earlier, Patrick, assessment. So also that's one interesting article about what would be if, if you just uh, adopt um, what, what we see in the creative industries, world awards. Um, so not assessing, but just awarding and just pushing for, for excellence. And just um, then certainly you might know this, actually it's this wonderful framework actually from, from the University of Winchester that's in here from, from uh, Spencer Lucas Claxton. And finally, actually- before, before you go on, there was one thing I want to share about assessment. Uh, it's a very old Buddhist saying, um, where attention goes, energy flows. Where attention goes, energy flows. So if we put our, what we assess is where the energy is going to go. 
So if you think about in the workplace and throughout our whole life, what we're being assessed on is where our energy is going to go. So what we assess is humongously important to how we develop people moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Then finally, and that was for me at the end, um, really exciting and, and it needed to be at the end, not only criticize and say, yeah, who, who actually did it already? So um, I reached out to six outstanding uh, schools who are already proving that this works and uh, six school leaders from the uh, USA, Canada, Japan, Sweden, and certainly also Finland share their secrets and insights about their innovative educational approach uh, in the book. And schools, so um, actually that already today create an environment where creativity can bloom actually and allowing students to discover what they enjoy to finally develop their individual creative and also thinking skills. And by the way, again, thanks uh, to you, Christoph, to take the time also to contribute a great article to the book. It's an honor. Also Thank you. Your colleague Thank you. on board. Tell, tell us in some minutes what, what uh, you are actually your colleague, where, where, where these flying kids are. <laughs> What he wrote about. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I tried to uh, submit uh, several uh, uh, chapters or materials uh, with a with a large delay <laughs> to this to this book oh, actually. Okay. And uh, there was uh, one thing about our South African uh, corporations, but it's also South Korean if you want because these kids uh, uh, using South Korean. Uh, hands-on tools uh, to represent uh, this uh, geodesic dome. Of course, it's connected to Bucky, Buckminster Fully, uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, uh, heritage as well, but in the same time, it was a co pro uh, program connecting digital modeling with GeoGebra and also hands-on modeling on this joyful way. Uh, and problem solving uh, on the fly in, the, in, this, in this program. But there were also some mathematics and art uh, projects uh, introduced. So uh, this mathematical creativity uh, was involved and also embodied uh, creativities in terms of a very active classroom. And this came uh, from our colleague uh, Jukka Sinnemäki uh, from the local school in Finland. So uh, I, I was really uh, happy to uh, share you these practices and also our practices in teacher education. But uh, I, I found really, really interesting other things uh, in this book. So I just can't wait to get into my hand and uh, read them all. So thanks, uh, Leonard. Yeah, thank you, actually. So um, I would like finally at the end to mention that the, the book is, is a private project and that's also self-finance. So net proceeds from the book says go to the Education Y Foundation. And um, just some things, as one of the five social partners of the OECD in Germany, Education Y is helping to shape um, actually a little bit of the next, uh, the 21st century education at an international level. Um, and uh, so that's just, it's it's nothing where I earn anything. So um, maybe as an outro, just also to not, not take too much time, some uh, two minutes also again on to take a look at the pages. I don't know if we see your screen now. Do others see your screen? Yes. Okay, good. Finally, actually, somebody, a lot of asked me why I did all this work, and I hope that by collecting and archiving all those excellent and outstanding approaches that they've been shared really uh, with the most people and that educational practitioners might discover some food, that it brings food for thought and enables them to really um, inspire their work, their daily work, and also parents. Um, and keeping in mind that this book draws broad conclusions from a small sample, actually. I consider the collation of this work an ongoing process. So everybody of you, if, if anybody has, has methods to share or ideas, send it in to me. Um, 
And I would like then in the second edition that probably or might be then by an editor also that these are included or that uh, everything's all included on the blog uh, so far. So everybody who has, first of all, an idea or just mentioned that if you want to create a cover, even, I mean, you know that everybody's a creator. It doesn't matter if you know how to draw it, just do it and share it with me. This, this dolphins and cows could be a cover, I don't know. And then certainly would be happy that if you want to pre-order one book, um, Christoph mentioned that already, it's, um, it's going to be on our end of August. You could just um, reach out to the page and uh, there's also a web shop and just order one um, and then I will send it out to, doesn't matter where you are. So um, thanks again, Christoph, for giving us that opportunity. Also, Patrick, so much for, uh, thanks for your help and for, for that talk today. So um, that was our part so far. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Leonard, for taking this effort uh, to wandering around the world and uh, looking for all these practices. And thank you, uh, Patrick, for uh, supporting this uh, project with, with all, all your energies and all your involvement. It was, it was absolutely fascinating. And um, actually, uh, we already got uh, a few questions. I would like to encourage uh, also everybody here uh, to uh, come uh, in the space and uh, also switch on mic, switch on camera and engage uh, into some conversation uh, with our guests. But uh, here we have uh, also uh, some ga game designers with us who are also thinking to reform uh, education uh, in a play-based uh, uh, way and, and, and through, through games. And um, he asked me that, do I know that, uh, for example, Patrick, uh, are, you, are you using also hands-on tools uh, in your school? And uh, what's the relationship between uh, digital learning and hands-on learning and, and also in this uh, STEAM um, uh, context? How do you see this uh, hands-on uh, and digital uh, balance or importance? Yes, thank you. That's a, a great question. And I, I put in the chat box that uh, one thing that I've been really feeling strongly about for a long time is that, you know, if you think about games, games historically have been leveled. So you go to the next level, you go to the next level, you go to the next level. And learning is also leveled, um, which is quite interesting. What's changed in the kind of gaming world is it's there's a lot more role playing that's happening than leveling. So you're seeing a lot of different interactions amongst people that are uh, people are role playing. And so um, what's interesting is that you can role play a lot now, a lot of different scenarios together, together with people. So you don't necessarily even have to be face to face to do that. And so what I'm really excited about is the potential for virtual reality. And as the, the mm. you know, Oculus lenses or whatever moves forward. And, and the problem is the difference between what we see in a headset and what our eyes see, there's still a gap there between the two. But once those two converge closer um, and the whole world gets the internet, I think the opportunity to experience different places and cultures and things that are happening will be exponentially expedited. And so that I think is gonna be a humongous change when you start really, and what's also interesting about virtual reality is that you think, your brain believes it's actually happening. In your brain, you think you're experiencing that. And so if you think about what it is about wiring your brain, the, neuro, the neurons are being wired, believing that you're actually experiencing that. So the opportunity to use technology to, to, for our brain to believe that we're experiencing something has a humongous potential impact on moving things for, forward. And the hands-on side is really important. I think doing things, it's one of the things that's very interesting about Japan is that there's a lot of mentorship here. There's a lot of making and craftsmanship in your hands. And there's something about, I don't know the, the kind of neurological background, of it, but there's something about when you actually touch something, it, 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 there's an emotion or a connection that happens. So hands-on is very important. And, and, and in nature is even more important. So if you're having real hands-on in nature experiences, it's really, really powerful. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm absolutely agree with you. I hope Imre agrees with you too. He, he uh, was the source of this question, uh, actually. Great question. And uh, I, I see here a lot of 
people whom I whom I already know. I I don't want to be invasive or uh, how can I say insulting to anyone. So I wonder if I can bring some people into the discussion. But <clears throat> I see here, for example, Charlotte Graham uh, from Sweden. I hope you don't feel it as an insult, uh, Charlotte, uh, to address you. So uh, you are a specialist uh, also in uh, early childhood education and preschool education. And I think uh, this is an area uh, which uh, should be bring, brought here because it's, it's before the classroom or, or it's in transition to the classroom, but many things happening uh, in, this, in this space or everything is happening almost now. So Charlotte, what's, what's your reflection? Do you have a question or a comment uh, to our speakers? Yeah, I find this book extremely interesting because I think we've just finished and sent into Routledge, I think a very similar book. And I'm just now wondering, I want to read this one. Um, and I found the illustrations and the way you've done the layout of that um, really adding to, it says something about what it is we want to achieve. Um, and as you say, it's important to start early uh, as well, as Christopher was saying, I'm not sure I'm, I am a, a specialist in early childhood education. I, I do, I've, I'm actually a specialist for, um, for um, ages, um, from about six to uh, 18. Um, that is my area of expertise. So, but I, I am now for Christoph doing something for early childhood education and investigating that a bit, taking help from other specialists. That is true. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna order this book straight away. It looks extremely interesting and extremely uh, important, I think, to think about how we can change education because there is a need to educate for for the future of these young people rather than which we don't know what it is rather than for our past which is what I think we've done a bit uh, up till now we educate them through specific subjects we divide everything we don't encourage collaborativeness really because we we put in um, there's always an element of, of um, competitiveness rather than collaborativeness and and uh, grading and perhaps grading the wrong things. And I think there's a lot to be done. And it seems that you've, uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head or whatever you say in, in, in many areas. In this. Um, I really enjoyed your, your lecture here. Maybe your class could, could hand in and submit covers. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Sorry? <laughs> The class could also submit covers in the next week. Wouldn't that be a great exercise? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please do so, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the briefing so, It's so wonderful that you're uh, focusing on early childhood education. It's, uh, I wish that we would double the salary of all teachers working with children under the age of six years old. Yeah. Uh, I think 80% of the brain is developed before we're three, and they say close to 90% by four or five. And so where is the importance of learning and the development of that? And who should we really be honoring and training is those early mm -hmm. childhood teachers. And so that's so great. You guys are focusing on that, really. But the thing I found is that because I'm the head of a, I'm the principal of a school. And now when I've been doing this investigation for the, these webinars, um, I then visited my, the preschool right next to, to me. And I was amazed on what they do that I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. they, they, they do amazing things. And then we bring in the children to year one and we start from scratch. We don't realize what they've actually learned before. And they don't have the words to, to uh, articulate and stop us from, <laughs> from teaching them again, perhaps in a more boring way. So actually there is already a lot happening. It's, it's a matter of uh, bringing out the good um, the good ideas and, and examples and, and spreading them. Absolutely, and uh, also the emphasis on those skills which are so fundamental uh, mm. through, throughout all the life. And actually, you, you don't learn them as a discipline or you don't learn them as a subject. 
and the mm. school is so much uh, focused uh, on on this subject and discipline uh, based mm. uh, learning and uh, this whole world of imagination is somehow need to be put aside in in many many of the schools uh, while uh, this could be the source or the resource of uh, of also these skills and 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 the community and and uh, many many things which are, which is so important so uh, uh, Charlotte is from uh, Sweden, and uh, we have also someone here from the UK, uh, Pamela Bernard. Uh, Pamela is a professor of uh, creativity, uh, creative education, or creativities in education in, in Cambridge uh, University. Uh, you are already uh, know her, actually, or most of us know her already, of course. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful, Pam, that you, you could make it. Uh, I'm sorry that <laughs> the registration process wasn't the easiest, but we, we are caring for safety. That's another issue. But uh, please, uh, you, you had a very interesting comment. Uh, would you like to, to summarize us and, and, and have some conversation? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just a joy. I wouldn't have missed this for the world just to see these all of you gathered and uh, to hear the inspiration and this, you know, it's about hope, but it's it's more than hope. It's about the doing of change and this sort of like a dandelion seeds blow in the wind. These seeds of change need to be coming from all ends of the earth, all ends of the globe. And it's meeting today. Thank you so much. Uh, Leonard, I've got your book on, on uh, order. I'm counting the sleeps until it comes. <laughs> oh, and thanks so I, much. You're I, so great. I, I will be sending various uh, images for the potential. I love that collective kind of investment that you're inviting people to <laughs> kind of bring, uh, you know, uh, ideas to the book, even at this point. And that is a disruption. That I'm I almost really crying. Help. It's a, a, because you know we need that kind of rebelliousness, and I wonder how you've worked with your publisher. You know, because publishers are also part of the hegemonic kind of instrumentality, the neoliberalism of, and yet they're but they're making all the money. So good on you. I love that. My question Thanks, is, is different to the one that's in chat because that was four minutes ago. Uh, since then, I've had about 40 questions. This is the one for now. And then this is about space. Now, people speak about timetables, you know, and teachers say, I don't have time. I don't have time. There's just no time. There's no space. Can't do it. Won't do it. Uh, in terms of transdisciplinary uh, uh, change, to the timetable or interdisciplinary, if that's the way you want to, you know, either way. I, I've, I'm encouraging uh, teachers and, and, and head teachers, governors, parents to think about space tables. But I want, you know, where, where can we kind of create ruptures to enable the space to think very differently? And I wondered, what have you got in this book that actually uh, will help us to share different models of space tables. I refuse to say the other one. Uh, with uh, uh, you know, school communities, because it is a community, not something that should be done after school or at lunchtime or a club on the weekend, but rather to really erupt the model that we have of assembling you know, the schedule, the structure of a school day um, so how do you do, you know, how, what examples have you got of that sort of rethinking and reconfiguring the school day in order to think very differently about change strategies uh, that the teachers are happy to sign up and engage, uh, engage with? Uh, and, the, and that may well be something, last point, because you're a systems person and that's where you also perform interdisciplinary, transdisciplinarity, because you're bringing these different perspectives, the multivocality to this book, which I can't wait to read. So how are you working with space? Where is it in the book? And how uh, are there any models of structural seismic change that schools have done in order to do differently when it comes to teaching learning in the 21st century for the future 
It's a great question, actually. It's um, pretty simple. What um, there's, there's a chapter about, uh, and I just uh, shared one page, about the organizational design of school. And what I practically did is to, um, to transform the 70-2010 method from Google to, to the school design. So um, that's, that's what you saw on the page with Eric Schmidt. So he included actually that uh, framework to be sure that everybody at Google works 20% on the time on the things on, that he really loves. And the idea is actually to have a 20% time frame for passion. So it's just only, it's a, it's a passion more or less. So you have like um, a certain time frame that's for certainly for the knowledge that's be based, then you have actually a certain time frame that's clearly regulated and also different spaces that's for passion and then for execution of projects. And this is actually, that's practically why, why Google is so innovative because they give a lot of time for innovation. So that you, because just imagine if you would only work on search, then they would only be, they wouldn't be having cars or glasses. It's just because somebody had time to focus on things that he would really create. And that's that's just a simple. So it's it's in one chapter actually it's about the organization design. So you will find it. Thank you. Great. Can Thanks I can I, add, can I add? Very to that? good news, please, Patrick. So one model that's quite interesting is the international baccalaureate model, um, and especially for the primary years program, the middle years program, it's become quite institutionalized. So it's it's kind of gotten out of its its raw form in some ways that it had had initially started, but it's quite a solid program. And the key thing is really finding that the balance between a project or a theme or something that the students are working on to, in their grade level, a common one, and then getting the different teachers who are involved to work together and plan together to integrate those different areas. So all of a sudden, one period of time can become two periods of time or three periods of time because those different teachers are all together there working together or correlating um, these kind of themes together. And the real trick that, that the most difficult thing for teachers is, you know, if they're not following the textbook or the exact curriculum, is to make sure that they teach or have covered or the students have learned all the different areas that the government is requiring of them. And that's the, the challenge, but it's this co-working, co-collaboration. So schools need to create time for teachers to be able to um, sit down and plan together and be able to then think about a common theme or subject and how they can integrate their different subject areas into that. And then time becomes less of an issue. Yes. Uh, let me uh, bring uh, someone more uh, into, the, into this discussion. So uh, here we have uh, Karin, Karin Steen uh, from South Africa. So Leonard, you selected this beautiful picture uh, from uh, Port Elizabeth, and actually it was Karin's uh, work that uh, she was among those who organized uh, that event in, in Port Elizabeth. And now she's heading the Met Art uh, Challenge in, in South Africa, where there are many, many hundreds of children creating these beautiful artworks. And you, you have also a chapter on this uh, in your book. So here is Karin. And uh, I would like to ask Karin first that how's the, how's the competition? How many submissions? How, how do you see the current status? Because you have big moments in these days, right? Thank you, Crystal. Yes, and thank you everybody for, for all this interesting discussion. I'm really enjoying it. Um, yes, Crystal, you're right. We're mid in this, this year's competition and we had uh, and, well, not well, quite a lot more entries than we had last year during COVID, but not as many as we would have liked. We had more than 400 entries from um, grade 7 to 12 level, and it's it's been quite an interesting journey. What we've always discovered is that that many learners really reach out and grab this opportunity of taking something which is maths and more rigid or experienced as something traditionally more rigid in class and then combining it with art and then also having a venue to express themselves emotionally, their frustrations with life. So we've really been finding this such an interesting um, pathway. And also, as I'm now reviewing some of the comments that the judges, we are currently busy judging the, the competition artworks, and some of the comments that the judges have been sending me are also so interesting to read how they are 
um, that their eyes are opening to how learners experience things and just how they are actually combining things. Mm. And um, yes, I, I looked at some of these children's artworks and realized how the, the competition is actually over the four years starting to mature in certain respects with what type of entries learners are sending in as well. So it's, it's really been a great process. And then I also want to say that I, I Charlotte, I have so much um, compassion for what you have said with, with regards to going to the school right next door and then seeing how things happen. I've been humbled a lot. One tends to, to rush into a school, even with a math art competition, promoting things and pushing people into, yes, this is how we do it and this is what we do. And then they come back and say, but okay, this is what we've been doing. And then you realize, oh dear, <laughs> maybe I should keep quiet first and listen and learn and then um, talk. So yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Crystal. I don't know if there are any other questions with regards to the math art competition or the path that we're following here. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karin, uh, for uh, being with us. And um, uh, let me ask you that, um, how, how do you see the importance of, uh, of, of creativity in, in, in South African <clears throat> classrooms? How, how much is it recognized? Because I also see that uh, there is a very strong trend uh, now. I, I see more and more events and more and more recognition also for your work, uh, for the STEAM mm -hmm. movement in South Africa. There are big congresses, conferences organized, and uh, hundreds of teachers are visiting these really massive events. And uh, I also got to know about outdoors learning parks in, in beautiful areas, uh, how much uh, these uh, contents and these approaches reaching those children who are really in the most uh, need, uh, because we know also there are big, huge differences in, in the system uh, and, and in the access. So how, how you manage to reach uh, those who are the most excluded uh, maybe of this elite uh, uh, learning and yeah, what, what's, what's your approach? And thank you, Chris. Yes, your your final words, elite approach, is is actually what I, I don't know how the other countries experience this, but the whole STEAM approach. And as I've been visiting schools, the elite schools, a lot of them have STEAM programs where they have a, a fantastic maker space or a room and a program that is pushed and funded by the school and the governing body, and they go ahead and they have really awesome things with regards to STEAM. But in the really rural, rural, poor schools, people are just battling to get down to business of teaching maths. And the, the creativity or the amount of, of things that reach those kids is very low. So what, for example, some of the projects that you're referring to where they take kids to the outdoors, they take kids out of the school, but then it's, it's like maybe once a year, a project where the children are taken out into nature, have a STEAM program done with them, and we do the same in our centers. So maybe once or twice a year, we will visit an area, have a STEAM workshop, excite the kids, hopefully show them that there is something else. But um, in, in the actual classroom itself, there's very little creativity as teachers are really battling um, to, to get just down to, to focusing on the curriculum and pushing through and getting the work done. So currently what we're experiencing now, we've just uh, last week finished another round of professional development with teachers where we really try to excite them to try something new in class to make maths learning a bit more fun and um, do something else for them and they come back to us at the stage um, because they don't have connectivity with their learners and their learners are in, in an approach where they only come to school in the junior grades especially grades uh, in, the, in that junior high school grades sorry they come to school only on every second or even every third day. And, and the days in between, although they give the kids work to do at home, they do absolutely nothing or they take it as a holiday or most of the kids do nothing. So the poor teachers are so stressed out just to get the work done in those days that the kids are at school. So yeah, that, that's quite a challenge. Sorry, I've been saying so much. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that was really belong to the topic and, and it was very important. So uh, we are uh, heading uh, towards the end uh, of this uh, uh, session. So uh, I'm really thankful uh, for uh, being uh, with us and 
still, uh, if you have uh, any questions, I guess uh, Leonard and Patrick will share uh, also contact details and uh, websites uh, of their upcoming book. So please support uh, the book uh, and please get the book. Please watch uh, how this book is uh, coming soon. And uh, Leonard and uh, Patrick, uh, do you have uh, something as a, as a conclusion uh, now? Well, I think um, Patrick already said so, so much that needs to be changed. And I think it's just only that we need to push change. And Pam underlined that so fantastically. I love this passion also. And um, I can just only hope that, that that a lot of people just only are inspired and think. And that's what happened with me. It's just, oh, just maybe maybe first start at home and just, just uh, try to in, in inspire my own kids um, to do something differently. What my parents actually did, um, just um, also very early on, and uh, yeah, that's I think that's uh, starting starting in your own in your own home turf. I think that's uh, that's probably the easiest. Thank you everybody to really uh, being here and just uh, interested in all that work that we've done. Also, thanks again, Patrick and everybody. Good. Thank so you. So excited. Uh, actually, uh, Unkok uh, raised hand. Uh, Unkok, uh, do you have something? Uh, for one minute. <laughs> uh, I want to ask something about the STEM project uh, because uh, we need. Uh, I need your your idea actually because uh, I'm a teacher in Indonesia there and I'm always confused to looking for context context in around us because. Uh, sometimes we know that around us so many contacts we can make to be a project stamp. But when we to connect to our curriculum, I'm so always confused how to make the the smart project and can be implement to our student. And maybe you can share me how to how to ident identify uh, some content, some context to be a STEM project like that. Maybe have idea for that. Thank I'm you. I'm pretty sure that Patrick, you have tons of materials. I think the key, the key thing, as I was saying earlier, is, well, I didn't share this part. So in the inquiry process, when you're going through and you're co-constructing things with the students, Let's say that you've chosen a topic or a theme in your area. By the way, Apakaba, I hope it's bike or bagus. Um, and in your area, try to make it relevant in the context for the students. But if you choose a topic or a theme, and then you ask the students to come up with what they want to learn about. And so the students will come up with a bunch of their questions they want to have answered. But as a teacher, you also have your questions you want them to answer. And you collate those questions and answers with the content that the students have to learn in those different subject areas. So what happens is you, you, you'll have the students ask them, well, you know, what do you want to learn about, you know, let's say water drainage or whatever, whatever the topic is, sustainability or something along those lines. And then you say, what, what, what questions do you have? What do you want to learn? What inquiry are we going to do? And the students will come up with lots of questions. And then you look at their questions, you say, okay, which of the subject areas or, or content that you have to teach can you put in with each of those questions? And so it's kind of like a puzzle. You're taking the students' questions plus your questions and bringing them together to ensure that they've learned the content that you have to deliver. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got it. But uh, I have met uh, two projects in the last years. Uh, the first project to uh to <laughs> uh to to gardening to gardening uh long peanut and build, build a building and then when i evaluate my my project this is just just activity so uh how to make the how to build their creativity critical critical thinking and the other so I'm so confused uh, how to make them to be a uh, gregat. What is the meaning gregat? Uh, wait. Interesting to this project. Just they just just uh, activity, not deep thinking like that. So 
right now I'm still uh, learn about this project to make the make sense to to my student. Yeah, so I think you said it is is getting the students interested in the subject, and the best way to get students interested in the subject is for them to create questions they have that well they could learn more about that subject. And it's making that connection in the beginning, I think, is really, really important. Yeah, like right now, I'm sitting here in WeWork, and we're going to be creating the uh, WeWork Olympic Games. And we're going to be looking at uh, areas of ec excellence and best practice. But we're co-creating the different games, the different subject areas, the different questions that we're going to answer. And that process of co-creation will engage the learners to want to, to go further and learn more. So I think it's the balance between you as the teacher telling the students what they need to learn and them feeling like they're in control of their learning and you're kind of guiding that learning through their questions and through the inquiry connected with the topic that you're teaching. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Maybe somebody else has something to share as well, but that's my, would be my answer to your question. Uh, Chris, you are muted. Yeah. Patrick, I, I, that's a great answer. I think um, tying it all back to really being connected in a human connection between teacher and student and being um, in this in an in, ex, in an exchange where where you're finding uh, common ground to uh, leverage to to allow students to to exercise their creativity so that they can learn more. I, I, I think that's a um, that's really great advice. We need to, it's time for us to move <clears throat> forward though. And um, uh, our next speaker is Rinus and um, Christoph, you you are um, longtime companions or longtime friends. Um, and would you would you introduce him to the those attending, please? Of course, of course, I'm really, uh, honored uh, to uh, introduce uh, my uh, friend uh, and, if I may say, colleague uh, in uh, a few uh, projects, uh, Rinus Rolovs. And uh, Rinus uh, is, a, is a sculptor and also a mathematician. It's uh, uh, many ways uh, a unique uh, constellation, especially in, in his case, because he's a uh, nurturing uh, and 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 maintaining both uh, carriers uh, in the same time and uh, connecting uh, these areas in in his art and also in his research and uh, his uh, art uh, is very very special both for uh, the art world and both for the math audience so it provokes a lot of attention in 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 all of these uh, fields and he's also a uh, very devoted educator. So he's not only uh, a star in galleries uh, all around the world, he is uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's never tired uh, to sit uh, in his car and pack all this hands-on equipment uh, related to his artwork and bring to children anywhere in the, in the world, uh, driving many, many hours uh, with, with his uh, uh, equipment and uh, teaching uh, through playing and to, through creating all those uh, really uh, complicated uh, and simple ideas, uh, what, what he can show that how simple things and how minimal efforts can also lead to, to maximal outcome. So his work is also connected uh, to design uh, on, on many, many ways and many applications are also coming uh, uh, from, from his ideas, from his work. I'm happy to uh, know Rinus like more, more than uh, 10, 10 years ago, maybe 15, 15 years ago and uh, watching uh, his, his career. And um, I, I'm, I'm really happy that today he's inviting us into his, uh, into his own studio actually. So we can, we can see the place uh, where he's working. And he's also decided to share uh, some very new problems, very new things, what he's currently working on. So Rinus, the, the floor is yours and we are very excited uh, to see what you show us. Okay, um, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, 
can you make my screen uh, bigger or uh, I, I think now I... now you are uh, the big biggest possible okay well I, I see myself in a very small uh, screen. Uh, yeah I think now you are pinned and maybe your view is set somehow as but I ask ask the audience uh, do you see that Rinus is full screen now right Yes, when he speaks, when he speaks, he is full screen. Okay, well, um, yeah, well, uh, I made a, spe a very special talk for, for today. Uh, so uh, all what I, all the things I show uh, were just prepared for for this uh, talk, and um, I have to say that my uh, inspiration for this talk uh, comes from uh, a book, uh, a book which was printed about five hundred years ago, uh, a book by the German artist Albrecht Dürer, uh, he is known for his paintings and, and uh, graphic works, but uh, he also wrote some very interesting books. And um, the book, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, a book w which was meant as an, a source for inspiration for, for other artists and, and um, uh, other uh, craftsmen. Uh, yeah. So for, for, for very different fields. And um, there was uh, a very interesting chapter, uh, which was about building models of polyhedra. And Dürer came with the idea to um, make plans for polyhedra. So uh, it, with this plan, it is very easy to build a paper model of a dodecahedron. Um, this was very new for, for that time. Uh, well, in fact, Dürer was the first man who came with the idea to make plants uh, which you could cut out of paper and uh, fold it into uh, a dodecahedron. So it's a very um, neat way to, to make paper models. Uh, when you look at uh, the dodecahedron and you want to make a model, well, you should think, well, you have to know all the angles. But when you make a paper model, uh, the problem becomes very easy uh, because you just fold and when they connect, it's okay. So you don't even have to know the folding angle. It, it comes all right. And uh, that's new. Uh, so you don't have to, to know anything about calculations of, of angles and uh, you, you can make complicated models with trick of uh, introduced by Albert Dürer. Well, um, he also made a plan for a cube, uh, which is very simple. I, you will know this one. And you can fold the cube by just folding all the faces together. And you've got a cube. Uh, I think the cube is the, the only polyhedron uh, from which we know what the folding angle really is. It's 90 degrees. And for all the, all the other polyhedra, it's, well, you don't have to know it when you make paper models, but when you want to make wooden models, uh, well, you, you have to calculate the angles. So when you want to make a, a wooden model of a, a dodecahedron, for instance, you can cut out the, the pentagonal faces and glue them together, but now, well, the angle isn't very convenient. So you have to know the angle before you put them together. And for the cube, the angle is 90 degrees. So for a wooden model, it's very easy to, to make the parts. And um, nowadays, many students have uh, access to a laser cutter, uh, especially on high schools or universities. So you can make uh, very neat models and you just can put them together like this and you get the angle. And because the laser cutter cuts a 90 degrees angle, it fits. It fits all, all, always. So with the laser cutter, cutter, it's very easy to make wooden models of a cube. So the cube is, is the only polyhedron with 90 degrees angles. Uh, so I thought, well, uh, if this is all you can make with the 90 degrees, uh, well, it's quite a limitation. But 
you can also see it as a, a, a challenge. Uh, you can think about what can I do with uh, folding angles of only 90 degrees to make constructions. Well, I was thinking about this and uh, came with um, a series of new ideas uh, of objects that could be made with only 90 degrees angles. Well, of course, in the field of polyhedra, uh, we've got the infinite polyhedron, the Coxeter one, which you can also make with the same unit that you use for the cube. So this is an infinite, inf infinite one. And I think this is a, a nice next step. Another structure you can make with just the square pieces uh, is this one. So here you see we connect at some points uh, six squares and at other points three squares. And so it's a combination of, uh, well, uh, points uh, that you connect. Well, this is about it when uh, you just focus on the square pieces. Uh, of course, you can take uh, some longer pieces uh, like this, but that's not really a, a new object. It's um, more like, well, uh, an, an enlarged tube in, in one direction. But when I look at this object, uh, I see a new element, and that's the double square. And uh, with the double square, you can make a, a real new object, which is not just an elongated cube. And at that point, it became interesting because uh, this new object, uh, well, is this one, uh, is an infinite object, so you can add as many double squares as, as you want. And it also has some kind of spiral movement in it. So we come to new objects, which are more interesting than just a cube, but uh, be aware that we only use 90 degrees angles uh, for the connection of the faces. Um, one, one more step in this direction was uh, the use of uh, the so-called L-shape parts. Well, you can combine the square, a double square, and an L-shape to make this object, but when you use only L-shape uh, parts, there's an infin infinite uh, number of, of uh, structures you can build with it. And I just want to show a few of them. Well, this is one of them. It looks like a stack of cubes, like this, but it's made with only one piece, uh, the L shape, and it connects nine, with 90 degrees. So it's quite easy to, to assemble this kind of uh, constructions. Another one with uh, the same parts, so you can see the difference of the, the both objects. And also, well, I'll show this one. So there's a variety of possibilities of what you can do with the L shapes. And uh, also in, in uh, the two direction infinity, uh, well, there are possibilities to make nice constructions with the L shapes, as you can see here. Well, this is still the, just a simple one, uh, a more complicated one I've got here. Well, I hope you can see it. Uh, it's kind of double layered and, um, well, so there are L shapes in, in the top layer and L shapes in, in the bottom layer. And you can extend it to infinity. Well, it's still limited to uh, more or less square faces or combination of square faces and um, I try to uh, expand the possibilities by looking at uh, other shapes of the faces. Uh, one first step was, was this one. Um, when you just cut a square face into two halves by the diagonal, uh, you can make this, this construction uh, with, again, only 90 degrees connections. 
Well, now we've seen a, a lot of possibilities that you can do with just uh, squares and, and uh, half squares and double squares. Um, one of the things um, that I didn't like about this is that you still stay in the uh, X, Y, Z frame uh, of, or grid. And um, when you look at the dodecahedron, you need an, another yeah, grid, an, another direction. Uh, so would it be possible to extend the possibilities of using uh, right angle constructions uh, in, in that field? Well, um, I went back one step and looked at uh, this object again and uh, I saw, well, at, uh, at all the points, there are six squares coming together. When I take out just that part, you can see here, this is the part where the six elements come together. And in fact, it becomes now another object. In which you can um, yeah, uh, recognize uh, a polygon in, instead of a polyhedron. And that polygon has three points. So it's a, in fact a triangle which you use to make this object. Uh, the first idea was to, to extend the polygon. So to make it not a, a triangle, but a square. But the, so like this one. But the challenge was again to make to use only right angles. And uh, well, you just uh, have to calculate the exact shape of the faces, but uh, you can reach the point where they connect in exactly 90 degrees. So now we have, we have a way to uh, build models of uh, polygons of any number. So this is the next one. But also here, it's exactly 90 degrees, like in this one. So here we have uh, the Pentagon. And um, well, we can go on with uh, other polygons, of course, uh, the hexagon, the heptagon, and uh, octagon, etc. But um, when you look at the pentagon, um, there are two ways to make a pentagon uh, based on five points. So we can make just this pentagon, but uh, we can also skip one point, and then we get the pentagonal star. And also, that one could be made with only 90 degrees. And uh, I've got the model here. And you see that, well, you can now see the Pentagon. But the model becomes more. So it, you see an, an entwinement of, of the elements. In fact, what you make now is a knot. Uh, so we now have uh, made a step towards the fields of the knots. And we can extend this uh, because uh, the 5-2 knot is, well, uh, the first one in the series. But we can go on with uh, other ones, like here, the 7. And you see here the nice knotted figure. And another one over here. So, in fact, there's an infinite series of uh, knots you can make in this way. So, this is always uh, uh, one uh, one uh, point that you skip to, to uh, reach the following point, uh, and you can make it more complicated by skipping more points. And um, well. Here you see the, the eight tree knot. And when you look at the side, you see the nice environment. All these models are very easy to, to assemble uh, because the 90 degrees angle that you need to connect uh, the pieces. So uh, all the pieces are uh, made by laser cutting uh, the parts and then connected in a very easy way because it's only 90 degrees. And well, this was the most complicated uh, I've made so far. 
this is based on the uh, 11 gone and it's the 11 4 knot, so it's a very complicated one. But still easy to assemble and uh, a nice challenge uh, for, for workshops or other occasions. Um, I want to step back to the field of uh, the real polyhedra, uh, and that's because um, uh, I, um, I, I discovered that uh, there was one more complicated object that you could make, make with only 90 degrees angles, and that's this one. This is uh, based on the icosahedron, uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, some pairs of triangles are uh, replaced by other pairs of triangles by using the diagonal of the two, and then you get this object. Um, in fact, this is a, an in-between step of, of uh, the Buckminster-Fuller process of uh, yeah, transforming an octahedron. Uh, it's a Jitterberg transformation of the octahedron in which all the faces of the octahedron turn and come back to the octahedron again. Uh, in between, you've got this situation in which all the triangles are connected like this, and uh, this is exactly 90 degrees, and this is also exactly 90 degrees. So this is a very interesting object, uh, which is yeah, some kind of polyhedron. Um, that brought me to the idea to investigate uh, if there were other polyhedron, uh, polyhedra we could make in this way. And I needed um, some inspiration of another source for that, that one. And that source was uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci came with the idea to make uh, elevations. Um, with elevations, I mean this. Uh, when you've got a tetrahedron, and suppose you place one tetrahedron on top of each of the faces, then you uh, got, uh, got a new object which looks like this. So you can see a tetrahedron on top of each of the faces. And the first step you can take is uh, when you lower each of those points a little bit, so you get 90 degrees angles. You've, you've solved half of the problem because all the connections here are then 90 degrees. The only connection that is not 90 degrees is this one. But there's a small trick you can apply to make that also 90 degrees. When you rotate the pyramids around their own axis, you can try to find the point where the angle here is 90 degrees. And the solution is this one. So here you see the pyramids on top of the faces. And here you see the connection where it now is 90 degrees. So in fact, we can build a, a model of a tetrahedron by using only 90 degrees angles. So we don't have to know the angle of the tetrahedron uh, itself. Uh, this trick could also be applied on a more complicated one. So what you see here is uh, the elevation of the icosahedron, in which you have got 20 pyramids on top of each of the phases. And now when you rotate every face, uh, every pyramid around their own axis, and try to find the angle where it becomes 90 degrees. The result is this one. So now we have really a dodecahedron in which all the angles, you can see it here, are exactly 90 degrees. So again, we can construct a model of a dodecahedron with just making these parts and connect them side by side and then construct the complete dodecahedron. So I thought this was a very a nice result of, of my exploration of 
um, yeah, the 90 degrees uh, application to build real wooden models. Um, I went one step further and um, uh, therefore I needed to go to uh, the, the jewels of uh, the normal poly polyhedra. Uh, what you see here is uh, a, a jewel of the cube octahedron. Uh, it has uh, 12 faces, 12 rhombs. And um, well, uh, I thought uh, the step you can make is uh, when you take each of the edges and you take a surface uh, perpendicular to this edge, uh, it cuts this one and this one. And well, it's better to demonstrate it from a model. So here you can see the final model and uh, this is the original phase of uh, the rhombic dodecahedron. Uh, what I did is uh, I just cut away parts of this face and I end up with this face and now you get a little piece to connect the faces but this is the face that was perpendicular to the original edge so there's a 90 degrees angle here and a 90 degrees angle here. So this was a method to uh, transform uh, a rhombic dodecahedron into a 90 degrees construction. So you get this, those nice butterfly faces and those connectors and it's very easy to assemble this to the, the final model. Uh, this uh, appeared to be a general trick. So here you've got uh, the model based on the dual of the Ico C dodecahedron, uh, uh, a polyhedron with 30 rhombs. So you can see the romb here. And you can see what has to be cut off of the romb to end up with the butterfly face. And then you can make the complete model. So because the original model has 30 ROMs, you've got, uh, you need 30 of those faces and then 60 connectors and then you have the final model. The faces uh, of, of the, the, the basic polyhedron don't have to be regular. Uh, so, well, I had another example here. Uh, so the face in this case, is not regular. It has four sides and that's important. Um, the model here is based on the dual of the rhombic uh, truncated uh, uh, cube. And it has uh, nice different faces. Uh, not square, but uh, rectangular uh, holes over here and triangles over there. So the trick uh, is, is very general and you can uh, transform any object uh, when it has, uh, uh, well, not square, but uh, face with four sides. Uh, you can transform such an object into uh, a 90 degrees construction. Um, So at that point, I step back to the cube and um, well, the cube has uh, exactly square faces and when you apply the, the trick of uh, the butterfly faces, then you will see that you end with uh, just two triangles that does, do not connect. Uh, so uh, with pure squares, this trick doesn't work. But there's a nice way to transform the cube a little bit. So instead of this plan of the cube, we can use just ROMs like this and the plan becomes a little bit different. And well, in fact, there are two different ways to do this. Um, well, it's a slight difference of, of the plan, but uh, the outcome when you fold the plan is totally different. Um, well, let me see. 
Um, this is, uh, these are the two different shapes. So the one is the elongated cube and the other is the flattened cube, so to say. And uh, these are really different shapes. And when you transform these into a 90 degrees construction, you will see that you end up with complete different objects. So this is the one, the elongated cube and with a nice triangle at the top. And this is the other one. The flattened cube. And you, you see the objects are totally different. Well, I think it's important that, um, well, uh, with this step, we created uh, a real fundamental step. Uh, at this moment, uh, in, in computer drawing, uh, there are two kinds of meshes that are applied. The triangular mesh, but also the quadrangular mesh. And uh, we now reach a point that uh, each of the quadrangular meshes can be transformed into uh, such kind of butterfly constructions. And uh, I just took one which was not as regular as the other ones. And well, it was quite easy to transform it into uh, a model that is really uh, easy to, to uh, construct. So I think this is a step that uh, could be very useful for workshops in schools, in schools for architecture, uh, but maybe also for other applications. So um, this is, uh, what I wanted to show right now, and um, I hope to have some questions uh, which I can answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Rinus. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> wow. So, could you, could you, um, Talk about a little bit about what was the insight that you had to think that that showed you the the initial um, extension of of a polyhedron into into these spaces. If, um, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the book of Dürer, in which he explained uh, a lot of things about plants of polyhedra. Uh, was a big source of inspiration for me. Uh, it was meant as a source of inspiration for the artist in, at that time, but it still is. And um, uh, I tried to understand uh, fully what Dürer uh, you know, tried to, to, to teach me. And um, I came up with uh, studying transformations of, of uh, polyhedra. And uh, so one of the transformations was uh, the Bergman's Fuller transformation. Uh, uh, and, and which ended up with, with this one. Uh, and at the moment, you see these two objects, uh, you, uh, I couldn't imagine that this was all. Uh, so this was in fact the starting point of my investigation. And um, it, it took me quite some time to uh, find real new shapes. And, uh, but step by step and uh, well, posing the, the right questions uh, again and again, uh, helped me to uh, reach uh, well my final presentation. Does it answer your question? Yes, yes, very much. I'm just still sort of stunned. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm without <laughs> words. Um, um, Pam has raised your hand with a question. Pam, would you uh, would you speak? Uh, give us your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Rinos, um, absolutely spellbinding, just riveting presentation. You filled it with, if you did a discourse analysis on what you were saying while you were introducing these different shapes and constructions, and you kept on saying, what if we were to, what else can we do with this? you know, and problem solving, you know, lots of times, you know, here is a problem and we're solving it. What if we, so this, this has been uh, coined possibility thinking. 
by uh, the now uh, um, unfortunately deceased Anna Kraft, who developed possibility thinking as the center of creativity, thinking, asking what else, what if we were to try and you know, engage differently or extend. You also mentioned Leonardo da Vinci. So can you tell us more about the idea of how we can work with our students in, in, in early years, in primary school, in secondary schools, you know, further education, higher education, to work with Leonardo's kind of as a model for this what if, because, you know, he seemed to ask that question of himself and of his work a lot. How does this question inform you and how might we use it in education more effectively? Thank you again. Yeah, well, uh, I think the, 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 the central word is uh, cura, cu, curio, curiosity. Um, yeah. Leonardo yeah. da Vinci uh, made drawings of, of polyhedra, but uh, he did it uh, when he was invited by a mathematician, Luca Pacioli. And um, I think they discussed the matter together, and uh, together they came with uh, new ideas. And mm -hmm. the idea of elevation um, was really new for that time. And um, when you look at an elevation, um, well, it comes close to, to uh, the ideas uh, which came uh, many centuries later. Uh, in fact, uh, what happens when you make an elevation of, of uh, in this case, an icosahedron, uh, is that you build a second skin around it. But uh, you have to look quite close and to read quite close what uh, Luca Pacioli and uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, re uh, wrote. Uh, before you understand what's really happening. And double-layered poly polyhedra, uh, that's what you get when you add a second skin around uh, a polyhedron. Uh, double-layered polyhedra, uh, polyhedra uh, yeah, were um, described uh, many centuries later. And also with uh, this uh, kind of things, well, I've got one here over here. So like this model, uh, this is a double-layered cube, as you can see. Uh, this is purely inspired by uh, the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. Mm. Uh, if you replace the outer face uh, like this by a pyramid, you get exactly uh, an elevated uh, cube, uh, which uh, da Vinci described together with Pacioli. Uh, so you have to read close and uh, to keep your mind open uh, when you read things and uh, try to, to stay curious, uh, try to uh, find questions uh, because it helps to understand, but it also helps to uh, come to new ideas, to, to get inspiration. Thank, Thank you. you. Just like you, you're the inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mentioning inspiration, uh, Stephen Jacobs became really enthusiastic uh, during the talk. Stephen, would you like to comment, uh, Torinos? Rinus, are you on drugs or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in, fact, in fact, in fact, I have to say I, I stopped drinking alcohol. <laughs> when you first started and held up the cube, I thought, well, this might be a good time to go take a nap, go back to bed. <laughs> morning, and then it was like sitting in a rocket. This it just shot off, and I really felt my feet not touching the floor under my desk. I was. It, it kind of scared me to have my brain. Really, I mean, I can see why kids would just at first run from something like this because it's, it's like going off a high board in a swimming pool, you know, the first time to go that deep into your brain to uh, picture an idea. You know, it's like jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. It's just to die. You had to dive and fall. And I was sitting there, I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, who is this man? Who is this man? He's pulling my head. I haven't had my head pulled into something uh, that deep in a long time, really. I mean, or at least there's a corner of my head that hadn't been expanded. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I need to go lay down. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. promise, promise. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, that's, that's true that um, when you show these objects 
and especially when also children and not just children but anyone else would have the opportunity to touch them and mm -hmm. to uh, get it done in our hand and change perspective and uh, look into that uh, from many angles it's uh, you certainly have the feeling that it's 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 something beyond uh, maybe your your visual capacities but but you but in your hand and you try to understand the the tricks and uh, you know this the, the, the magic uh, how how does it work and i think this is an important um, moment uh, also in 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 education to 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 provide uh, this kind of mi miraculous uh, moments and structures uh, and uh, you, you are doing this a lot uh, with uh, children and here we have a lot of teachers uh, also with us who are curious about this uh, three-dimensional uh, spatial senses and embodied uh, uh, thinking uh, this what, what, what is in your geometry so what, what's your advice uh, to, to the teachers uh, Rinus? Uh, well in, uh, in a lot of schools they, they don't talk uh, about uh, polyhedron uh, polyhedra anymore and um, well, I think that's a pity uh, because uh, already Plato started uh, to talk about this kind of objects. And uh, there's so much that you can tell about these objects, but also uh, the amount of inspiration you can get out of it, uh, that we have to bring those objects back into the schools. Uh, that's the first step. And uh, then a lot of stories can be told and, and a lot of... Uh, workshop events can can be uh, constructed uh, well uh, because i think this material that i showed you uh, well i showed you in, in a very short time but uh, you can take your time and uh, really uh, understand what's happening because uh, you're able to make the models yourself and uh, then you learn step by step uh, all about the three-dimensional world around you and that's the world in, in which we live. So uh, we have to know our way in it. Yes. Sh Charlotte really? just found some connections between the uh, two two sessions uh, today. So let yes. me uh, bring you here, uh, bring Charlotte here also, and then, then Chris, of course. Oh yeah, I, I simply stated that uh, perhaps the link as I see it is that the first session just stated that we need a new kind of education and perhaps how as well and STEAM is a part of that new kind of education and this material that we've seen now is a way that you can, a material that you can use as a part of reaching that aim. It's not uh, it's not a solution, but it's, it's a part of what we could use, mm -hmm, yeah. part of the solution. I'd like to ask um, a question, Renus. Um, do you have do you have access fairly close to you to that five three knot that you were showing? Could um, you hold it up again? The five two, you mean? Uh, five five two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the this, the earliest one, yeah. the, the earliest knot, yeah. Yeah. So when you decided to make that. You had to think through the the design of those individual pieces as well, right? The, yeah, there, yeah. The, there was there is an element of discovery and curiosity and actual hard mathematical work that went into to creating the the single piece. Is that am I fairly accurate in? Yes, but um, you also talked about levels, and um, I think uh, the, the design part behind this kind of objects uh, might be the next level also for the students. Uh, I use Rhino uh, together with Grasshopper. Uh, Grasshopper is a programming tool within, within Rhino, the drawing tool uh, on, on my computer. and. Um, because Grasshopper is a visual programming tool, uh, it's easy to learn by, by students, uh, even children from, well, let's say from eight years on. And uh, because you, you can see wh what you are doing and um, with that programming tool, uh, you can build the environment to, to create the real shape of the object. And when you've solved it for one, you've solved it for 
the complete selection. So also that gives a, a lot of uh, yeah, uh, understanding uh, about how things work and, and how things can be developed. So uh, um, starting with, with just building models uh, might be a first step towards the next level. Uh, how do you design those uh, objects? And, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah I, 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 I ask because there's some question about how do we link this sort of thinking into a scheme integrated program and and it's it's fascinating and beautiful work but it's also but there is also um, there are elements of new new mathematical methodology and new design methodology that that go into all of this that that um, that make for that that can be really intriguing for students and, and bring them and bring them into the process I think yeah 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 well um, I like to say that uh, when you want to teach people mathematics you have to start first uh, to let them fall in love with mathematics yes. and after that it's much easier to learn mathematics it's just like music when you don't like music it, it's impossible to learn a musical instrument and right. uh, so let's try first to, to uh, uh yeah to, to to let people fall in love with mathematics by just uh doing fun stuff and uh this might help I think it's a great it's a great step in there in that direction. It works for me. Got me to fall okay, in love okay. with math again. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah, there are some uh, comments uh, still uh, uh, coming in. So uh, about. Uh, collaborative, creative, embodied uh, learning and problem solving. And actually, this is what I've seen several times uh, with, with Rinus when these modular constructions being built in a large scale and many children, many families uh, could participate. Uh, and there was uh, Leonardo's uh, idea and Rinus actually, Rinus identified uh, in a in a in a mar margin sketch in 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 a in a in a codex uh, that that kind of uh, uh, construction method, and uh, he created these modules, and uh, then children and professors, many ages, many many knowledges uh, could come together and, and share this experience. So this is also belongs uh, to this. So uh, I'm really thankful for every one of you who participated uh, today. I agree with uh, Charlotte that uh, there were a very strong link uh, between the two, two sessions today. Maybe we didn't know it uh, before, but it turned out to be very closely uh, connected. So uh, we are, thank you uh, for, for joining us. And we would like to say uh, thanks uh, for the organizer uh, for the frame team in Seoul. Uh, they initiated uh, these meetings and uh, it has been shown that uh, these are needed uh, for global cooperation. We recorded uh, the talk again. So you will find these talks on 4D frames uh, uh, YouTube channel. I will put here what you need to put uh, uh, into the search uh, if you want to find uh, their YouTube channel and also experience workshop uh, steam uh, YouTube channel you can also find all all the uh, talks previously and this talk will be there too so uh, Chris uh, is there anything more uh, to conclude uh, today I have nothing else to add. I'm I'm still completely 
undone by the, by both speakers this this evening is just I'm speechless. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, let's uh, look forward to the next session. We will continue in in July uh, with other beautiful uh, speakers. Uh, will will join us with beautiful topics and. Uh, Stay tuned, uh, sign up also for Eventbrite uh, for, for these events, and let's uh, come together again uh, in, in a month uh, from, from today. Thank you so much, Mr. Park. Thank you, uh, Sung Walim, uh, for providing the firm background uh, for these meetings and also sending out invitations and communicating these events. And everybody stay tuned and also have a, have a beautiful STEAM summer and uh, I mean, okay, <laughs> there are different seasons <laughs> everywhere now, but anyway, have, have a creative time also meanwhile. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks for the flowers, Pam. <laughs> 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 I wish uh, I could give you real flowers, but, but it will happen soon, yes. Okay. The, the, per the performance of mathematics, surely. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Let's, Thank let's you. stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks for having us again. Thank, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a great day and have a good night, wherever you are.